Hello, everyone. Welcome to Essential Bushfire Safety Tips, the webinar with Joan Webster OAM and David Holmgren. It is such a pleasure to have all of you here, all 60 plus and growing of you, and all of you who are watching this in the replay. This is a very timely topic, and it will always be a timely topic because the majority of us live in fire ecology. We've we're on a planet that has evolved with fire. And fire ecology is a part of many of the landscapes we live in. My name is Javin Kirby Bernakovich. It's an honor to be your host tonight. I run All Points Land Design, a land and life design company that helps people, landscapes, and businesses create more abundant, diverse, and if necessary, profitable lives and landscapes and businesses that grow better year after year. And I also operate regenerativeliving.online a online educational company that helps to teach practical skills to live on the planet as if we intend to stay. My desire and my passion with fire was ignited a couple of years ago when I had the opportunity to craft a 22 minute documentary called Facing Fire, Building Resiliency to Wildfire, which you can find on um, YouTube. I'll put the link into the notes and the show notes below, as well as the follow-up emails. And as I was diving into the situation about wildfire, it was amazing to learn about how we got ourselves into this situation. And as many people know, we tend to bring outdated or outmoded mentalities into the new places that we are. And we tend to colonize not only the people there, but also their ideology and remove the indigenous ways of practice. And also bring in a number of technologies and processes that increase ignition and increase flammability. And as I was into that work, I came upon, uh, across Joan's work and was just floored at the incredible nature of her work that has spanned 60 years of writing, of journalism, and of coming at this from a sense of how do you bring the scientific knowledge, but also the immediacy of this issue. At that point, I was able to connect with David and he was able to provide some incredible footage for the film. And so a belated thank you to you both for influencing the film. Today, we're gonna to have a chance to learn a little bit more about Joan's work and David's work as it pertains to fire. We'll get a chance to understand a little bit about the fire situation as it stands in Australia today. And then we'll have a chance to ask uh, three primary questions to both David and Joan. And for everyone else, as you're starting to hear and experience what the conversation that Joan and David and myself are gonna to bring today, feel free to put any questions that come to you into the Q&A tab at the bottom of the webinar. So don't put your questions into the chat, but into the Q&A tab. If you find that uh, your question is answered as we go throughout the webinar, feel free just to mark it answered from your point of view. And if not, we'll uh, have the questions answered at the end of the webinar uh, as long as we have time for it. So with that, thank you again to everybody for coming today. I'm really excited to host this conversation. And without further ado, Joan, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit more and let people know about you? All right, Joan, we'll get you to unmute and uh, start again, if you wouldn't mind. Thank good you. afternoon. It's good to be with you. I'm Joan Webster, as Javin just told you. And the OAM after my name stands for the Order of Australia Medal. Uh, that's the equivalent of the British OBE, which I was awarded for the, my pioneering and long-term work on bushfire safety for the public. Now, for the past, past 45, 25 years, I've lived in a medium-sized country town, but before that, I lived in an outer urban area that was very vulnerable to bushfire. My use of the term bushfire, which you often term forest or wildfires, refers to any fire in a native forest. When at times those fires become wild, we call them wildfires. I've been an activist since a small girl in any area where this, to me something's needed doing about which I could do something. Bushfire safety isn't all I've written about, although that's what's consumed me for the past 40 years. Over the last 70 years, I've been published in poetry, journalism, folk history, children's stories, satire and mythology in print, radio, TV and stage, in many of which I've been very fortunate to have won a few awards. And after several years, I've run a Facebook bushfire safety awareness page, which maybe Javan might give you a link to later, um, which has almost 24 and a half thousand followers. I began lobbying and writing on bushfire safety 
trying to get authorities to put out information to the public in 1964. This was the year in which the municipality in which I live created the world first civil defence for bushfire. And I was a foundation member and that was the year before I became a journalist. I wrote my first book on bushfire safety in 1983, following the horrendous fires of that year, because I couldn't bear it that people had suffered needlessly through lack of knowledge. At that time, 20 years after I'd started pestering them, practically no information for the public was put out by authorities. And I was talking to my older daughter after that, we were so, I was so distressed about it all. And I said, they, they just have to do something. They have to put something out. And she said, they're not going to do it, mum. You're going to have to do it yourself. Well, I thought I couldn't. Uh, my health was in a pretty poor state and so were my finances. But then I thought, I have to try. It took me three and a half years. After publication of that in-depth, the complete Australian bushfire book, it was the first book of its kind, authorities began publishing brochures from which most of the safety ideas were taken from my book, as they still are. The majority of these I devised myself, such as the step-by-step -step, um, actions to do at each stage of bushfire, the personal survival kit, having protective shutters for windows, and it contained the first analysis on the dilemma of stay or go from bushfire. In 2001, I was asked to write a ready reference to make it easy for those who didn't want to read an in-depth book or didn't perhaps have the time to do it, to gain the, the same kind of information. So I wrote essential bushfire safety tips. And I organized this in dot point one liners to make its information easy to access and to read. But every line had to be scientifically accurate. So it was really quite a challenge, but I did enjoy that. And then I insisted that every word be checked by bushfire scientists as it was. It's all been verified by some of Australia's most eminent bushfire scientists. Its purpose is to bring a message of hope and empowerment that with appropriate knowledge, preparation and awareness, towns and people can safely survive the annual summer peril of bushfires, as so many of my readers have. Thank you, Javan. Thank you so much, Joan. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm emboldened to know that uh, the lifespan of our work can go well into our 90s and can have such an effect. And I'm, uh, again, just very inspired by your work. Thank you so much. David, would you uh, like to introduce yourself, please? And David, you're muted as well. So if you could unmute and start again, that'd be great. <laughs> yes, thanks, Javan. And thanks, Joan, for that um, brief outline of your background and career and, and the very substantial nature of that lineage of work with the, the complete book and then uh, the Bushfire Safety Book, which is now in its next edition uh, that I'm in the role as publisher, but of course, I'm also the co-originator of the permaculture concept with Bill Mollison in the 1970s. And in the early articulation of, uh, of that, um, uh, bushfire was actually a central theme as a subset that everywhere in the world, there are natural disasters that need to be part of how we design and how we live. And in the part of the world that we live in, um, that's the predominant form of, of natural disaster. So that's been a major theme in, in my work. Um, and I um, am interested in it, as Joan is, in the, the larger uh, sense of management of the landscape and all of those issues, but 
uh, like Joan, my focus sort of really started uh, in a permaculture sense at, at the back doorstep, where people live, what can they do in that sort of more immediate sense, which of course, uh, Joan's work has had that um, uh, concentration around that rather than these larger issues that sometimes are so overwhelming what should the authorities do about management of a, the vast public forests and all of those very, very complex and very, very important issues. But that empowerment of, of uh, what we do at home um, is very being central to my message also. Thank you, David. I'm, I'm reminded that uh through my experience of getting into permaculture and, and reading your work that uh, I, I once joked, there may have been libations involved that you might become the patron saint of uh, self-independent action around our own determination in this life, that it's there's a level of work that we can do around our own homes. And with Retro Suburbia, an amazing book you've put out is that we have the ability to take our lives and our action in our own ham. And as uh, Toby Hemingway, another author, of permaculture used to say is that these power contracts, we can take them on ourselves. So I so appreciate your work. And as others have said, very much life-changing. Thank you so much for your introduction. Now, David, you said that you'd be willing to, uh, to speak a little bit about the current situation about wildfires in Australia, but I wanted to preface that with a little bit of the foreword from the Essential Bushfire Safety Tips book, because it felt very apropos Bushfire is a part of the Australian environment. Before European settlement, fire was widespread during the dry seasons in most part of Australia. Prior to establishment of the state forestry services and volunteer bushfire brigades in the early 1900s, there was little capacity to check bushfire, apart from burning off early in the dry season around valued assets, just as the Indigenous Australians had done for centuries. People who lived in the country were familiar with fire, used fire, and knew how to protect themselves from uncontrolled fire. And I think that sets the stage quite nicely for your introduction and setting the stage about uh, bushfire in Australia today. Uh, yes, certainly it's a very different context in that um, uh, people uh, from a, an urban background um, disconnected more from the uh, threats and interactions, working relationship with nature uh, means there's that uh, disconnect. And also there's, a, of course, the outsourcing of management of land beyond the private uh, property uh, to public authorities, whereas so much of that used to be uh, in the distant past, sort of community-based uh, informal um, management. I suppose the other context, of course, is the worsening state of uh, bushfire threat. And there's two stories broadly in Australia that I've written about that compete and contrast what is the primary source of that. Uh, one is uh, an older story about lack of land management more broadly, often distilled down to uh, not enough uh, fuel reduction burning, but more generally lack of land management. And the other is the climate emergency. This worsening, more intense weather cycles that produce uh, more extreme conditions more frequently and increase the uh, likelihood and severity of bushfires. And I've written about how there's truth in both these, but sometimes there's a sort of a shouting match uh, about <laughs> which is the most important one and what needs to be done uh, first. And, and how these uh, can be hopefully drawn together, how we can do not just both uh, at the same time, but almost both through the same uh, sort of actions. So that wider context is there. And I suppose uh, the um, 2019 uh, Black uh, Summer that affected so much of the East Coast of Australia, uh, sort of brought that home, perhaps Joan's seen more of these cycles than I have of uh, awareness 
uh, of that um, and that with that hopefully a sort of um, an incremental movement that doesn't die down in the in-between seasons because of course unlike um, the northern hemisphere we are just coming to the end of our uh, towards the end of our fire season in Australia and in this particular year while the southwest of Western Australia has had uh, some fairly um, uh, significant and impactful uh, uh, bushfires, quite a lot of them. Uh, nothing like uh, the black summer that we had in 2019 on the East Coast. And on the East Coast, we've had the flip opposite of the La Nina uh, weather patterns that while they've been benign in the region uh, where Joan and I live, uh, up the East Coast, it's been the opposite, the horrendous sort of one in 500, one in 1,000 year uh, floods. And some regions, especially in Northern New South Wales, have been hit by this flip-flop of uh, catastrophic uh, wet season uh, impacts and then droughts and fire, more reminiscent, those fire seasons in those regions getting into the subtropics have been more reminiscent of the fire seasons we've been used to that some of those regions have not experienced in the past. Uh, I think the other thing that's important to understand is that while there's been a scale up of resources into uh, fire um, control from the command and control structures at the top, uh, even better equipment, more money, there's also been an undermining of some of the capacities of those systems through greater red tape, greater awareness about risk management and what risks volunteers can be put to. And uh, within the, the story of COVID, this unacknowledged question where there's significant numbers of volunteers who are actually not allowed to participate in those formal structures because they have chosen not to be vaccinated. So in some areas from anecdotal stories, it's up to a third or even more of the volunteers that are certainly not there. So that that's produced this crossover or bleed of some of those people back into the informal responses. Now, I'm not aware of whether that's been happening in the fire situation in Western Australia, but in the parallel catastrophic floods that is a disaster that's still been unfolding in Northern New South Wales, this self-organized community bottom-up response, if you like, coming to the next level from what a lot of Joan's work and my work has been at the household, level response is starting to happen also. And we've seen earlier versions of this where um, farmers have self-organized their own informal brigades because the formal services uh, called the, uh, the Country Fire Authority Volunteer Services in, in Victoria and the RFS in New South Wales, there's been some of the best uh, volunteer services in the world are now so formalized and bureaucratized and risk aware that it's actually just landholders spontaneously doing things themselves outside of those structures. So this is a very interesting dynamic that is not really being discussed where there's both an armoring of the command and control structures in response to these mounting disasters, uh, but there's also this rebuilding of the bottom up out of the frustration of some of the inefficiencies of those systems, which of course occur after every fires where, where there's complaints about, you know, that the authorities didn't do what, you know, they might've done. And of course, some of this is unrealistic expectations of, of urban people who just imagining that the cavalry will arrive um, when those things happen. So there's these complex interactions between the formal structures, the community self-organized structures, and then that core base that 
that our work has been focused on of the household uh, capacity, which no matter how good you get the systems at the top, you always need that household awareness and capacity to at least alleviate the demand or the dependence on those upper level services. It's so well said, David. Uh, again, coming to that place of self-determination and making sure that the, the informal structures in and around our homes and in our communities have a sense and ability to defend if they feel it's they're eligible for and if it, it makes sense. And I think that's something that Joan touches upon quite extensively in her book um, and really speaks to the ignorance. Uh, there was a quote here I picked up from her for it as well. Media claims of bushfires sweeping through townships, completely destroying them are inaccurate and made in ignorance without the understanding that there is an informal structure that can be built and needs to be built if we are to have a response that has defense in, in a way that uh, promotes livelihood. And I love, Joan, that in this version, this third edition, you have an entire conversation around township and, and how do townships protect and work with. And I think this leads us really well into this first question of, and it's you know the most basic question that we could ask is, what do you think can keep people safe from wildfire? Now, the conditions of forest fires or bushfires as we call them, are very different in your countries than they are in Australia. The climate is different, your vegetation is different, your house styles are different. But the way fire burns is the same the world over. It burns according to the laws of physics. It ignites, consumes, moves on and extinguishes the same way everywhere. And in a similar type of vein, the Natural Hazard Centre of Colorado said of essential bushfire safety tips, though it is written for Australia, its lessons are universal. So, what do I think you really need to do to be safe from bushfire? There are three aspects to the, what's needed. Preparation of the vegetation around your home, preparation of the house, and preparation of people. Preparation of garden vegetation can be like the life belt around your home. It needs designing of layout to prevent the flames from ignited plants igniting buildings. Having fire resistant plants rather than highly flammable plants and keeping beneath trees clear of grass and shrubs. Preparation of the house needs making it as proof as possible from ember entry. Ember entry, not so much plain, but ember entry especially the three core vulnerable areas of the subfloor, the windows, and the ceiling space or attic. It needs equipment that can manage without electricity because that often goes off during the fire. Reserve water in fire resistant tanks because also the reticulated water often goes off. And if affordable, a low flow roof sprinkler system, which is actually much more accurate than being ping bombed by an aerial bomber. And three, the preparation of people needs learning as much as you possibly can about how to react safely to a bushfire. Preparing certain protective clothing and is a very last and basic resort, a pure wool blanket. I'll tell you the classic story of the pure wool blanket. This goes back to 1939, and it's the first recorded instance of someone saving their life with a pure wool blanket alone in terrible circumstances. In those days, the timber mill workers used to live right down in the middle of the bush. When the fire swept down in 1939, I think I said, um, went to the Otway Ranges, the, the timber mill was surrounded. 15 men dived into the saw pit, the sand, there was the um, sawdust pit, thinking that it saved them. And unfortunately, they perished. But one man, his name was George Sellers, he took his 
really heavy duty, pure wool blanket, which most men living rough like that used to have. Put it around his shoulders, put his felt hat on his head, and he squatted there in a small clearing for four hours while horses screamed in their, in their stalls and the fire raged. But he survived because pure wool extinguishes embers when they land on them and it deflects radiant heat. You also need a detailed action plan to do when a fire threat arrives, whether that your plan is to evacuate, to defend your home, or as a last minute sheltering in it. You need that plan. And all members of the family need to practice the plan regularly. A few years after the publication of my first book, there was an extreme wildfire in the hills outside, Mel outside Melbourne. They're called the Dandenong Ranges. The scenic hills covered in dense forests, eucalypt trees, tree ferns, and small, well populated towns. The one family there had my book, and they had, as they told me later, brought their family up on it. They prepared the garden to be less flammable, prepared the house to be less vulnerable to ember entry, and prepared themselves. They had prepared, planned, and practiced. On the day of the fire, only their 22-year-old daughter was home, and she was persuaded by the helicopters flying overhead to evacuate, go to the evacuation centre, and she thought she'd better do as she's told. But when she got there, she thought, what am I doing here? I know what to do. So she made her own way home, put on her protective clothing and put the praxis plan into action. That young woman saved that house single-handedly. And it was the only house left standing in the street. Over the years, this story has been told and retold in many different ways by many different people in many different circumstances. And it shows what can be done when you are prepared for even the most severe wildfires. So Essential Bushfire Safety Tips has been written to help readers make informed choices about a safety plan to suit their own circumstances. It details the safe, and the hazardous actions and reactions to every aspect of a bushfire threat, understanding bushfires, killers and survival factors, how bushfires destroy houses, and all the fors and against against evacuating and defending your home or using it as a shelter, so that you can plan to suit your own circumstances because everybody's circumstances are different. Thank you, Javin. Joan, I'm I'm always surprised by the power of story and how, uh, when it's gracefully told, how it brings the person along with the whole conversation and just brings you into the situation. And I so appreciate those stories. It's something I find quite a bit designing fire uh, resilient and defensible spaces in in British Columbia is that most people are not aware of the processes and the conversations that can come with defending a space and the electrical pump, I think is probably this, this one element that makes people go, well, I'm, I'm defended because I have water in cistern and I have an electrical pump and I'll be able to defend my space. And the idea that they'll have electricity in a wildfire is just not reasonable. And the conversation about gravity fed watering system with thermoregulated uh, sprinklers is a great piece to bring in, but the, the basic nature of a wool blanket was something that was taught to me by the Yurok First Nation who run the Cultural Fire Management Council that teach indigenous cultural burning in Northwestern California. And the stories that they had very much mimicked that with uh, great aunts and great uncles who were able to survive by having just a pure wool blanket. And I think that bridges the conversation of, this isn't an Australian story, this is a human story of which there is nuances in different countries. And I love that you brought that up. Um, David, moving to you, I have a question um, thinking about, you know, you are not only the co-originator of permaculture, but you're also a publisher. 
helping to bring ideas. I think most of your work is about life affirmation and being involved in life affirming work. So what is your interest in wildfire safety beyond being the publisher of Joan's book? Yes, well, as I said, it was uh, central to the uh, an initial focus of, of permaculture, you know, just on the productive capacities of land and a self-reliant uh, way of life, but uh, that, that there was building resilience to uh, natural disasters. So that uh, fire, you know, because at Tasmania where Mollison and I worked on the uh, the early articulation of permaculture and Victoria in the southeast of the Australian continent where I've uh, lived most of my adult life is of course one of the almost the vortex of the uh, most intense uh, fire region in the world. But that original articulation of permaculture uh, occurred at Bill Mollison's uh, property where I shared house with him from 1974 to uh, uh, 77 and that was the house that he'd actually defended from the great uh, 1967 bushfires that devastated the fringes of Hobart the, the capital of Tasmania and I think there were uh, 70 people died in that and many many houses uh, burnt and that was my introduction to uh, stories like Joan uh, just told about a person single-handedly um, defending a house. And certainly that house was not one that you would describe as a, as a good design. And Mollison's story of actually being on the spot and firstly being caught out in the open space and going into a culvert pipe in a small still trickling stream under a willow tree and having the experience of the fire creating a huge ball of steam out of the willow tree instead of it combusting was our early introductions to this idea of fire enhancing plants, like all of the eucalypts that were mostly around his home and the fire retarding plants. But it was more dramatic, the fact that he came out of that and came up to the house and found that the house was burning at, at a doormat and uh, a barge board at one point and put those out with a mop and a bucket uh, and then saved another four houses while another 12 burnt down in that mountain each street of Strickland Avenue because there was no one else there. So this was the story of survival sheltered from radiant heat would have been better if he was in the house, uh, but then being able to save the house. So that um, uh, for me led on to in 83, the time that Joan did her, um, led to her complete bushfire safety book. A much more modest project that I did at that time was this case study in design of a house and landscape uh, for a property that was burnt out in the Dandenongs at that time. And uh, we republished that in 2009 after the very severe um, uh, Black Saturday uh, bushfires. And it was following on from that, colleagues of uh, mine um, who were survivors of those fires at King Lake organized events where I was privileged to share a, a platform with Joan as we uh, brought the more positive messages in the, in the winter following those severe fires back to those uh, communities that um, had been impacted and were dealing with those issues of rebuilding and where and, and how. Uh, so that's been a, you know, uh, quite a, quite a significant um, connection. So when the opportunity came to uh, the possibility that this essential <laughs> uh, book, this most essential book for just the average householders, and especially those who are, as Joan says, who are in towns on 
fringe areas that people don't think of as being, you know, right in the, the firing line of severe wildfire, but repeatedly have been in Australia and in North America in recent years, the opportunity to um, ensure it remained in print. Uh, we, we definitely jumped at that uh, opportunity to, to do that. David, the Flywire House was one of the first books I was introduced to that really focused on wildfire design and resiliency. And I was blown away at just the matter of fact nature of it. And uh, just another one of the opportunities I have to thank you in person for producing that work because it was instrumental in my understanding of, of wildfire and, and produced um, a number of designs from it. So thank you very much. Um, Joan, back to you. I'm, I'm curious because you talked a little bit about this and I talked about this in the Facing Fire documentary that um, it's very hard to burn a tomato. You know, here's something that's 99% water and there's a number of vegetative structures, especially annual gardens being pioneers and the way that their structure works and how much water they require. When you take a look at vegetation around a house, what, what's the best way to prepare vegetation around a home to prepare for wildfire? Well, when fire descends upon a town, the vast majority of houses that are ignited by, aren't ignited by flame from the fire they're very often ignited by flame from their own burning plants. And one third of house losses are caused not by embers burned by the actual fire itself, but from embers from those houses that have ignited because plants were too close to their house, send their embers off onto other houses. The garden layout and design can play a huge part in property protection. And there are six basic aspects to that. The first is distancing of flammable vegetation from buildings. Have paths between your garden beds in your house. No shrubs against flammable walls, no shrubs against windows, no hydrangeas against the windows, no shrubs against the subfloor spaces. In, in Australia, I don't know how your housing is there, but we often have timber houses that are raised slightly because they're on a slope and they have gap boards around them. And that's, that's the subfloor space I'm talking about. Now in planning this, you need to take into account that flames can rise to two to six times the height of the burning matter. So that can help you decide where it's best to put your more flammable plants if you still want to keep them, or your taller plants. The next, garden beds separated rather than in strips. If garden beds are designed like islands, separated by paths, if one plant ignites, the fire is contained in that bed. It doesn't spread onto other beds. Any fire will be isolated, the radiant heat will be less, and the embers will be more sparse. If ignition takes in a strip bed, then it acts like a fuse line going up to buildings. Walls of flame can happen, and that gives a lot of radiant heat and a lot more embers <coughs> are able to be blown around. Well, three, your types of plants, which David's been talking about. Few plants are fully fireproofed but ignition rates definitely vary from reluctant to resistant. Even low hazard plants can dry out when there's drought. And even highly flammable plants may not burn if kept well hydrated. There was an instance of that at Marysville in Victoria in the 2009 fires where eucalypts along a creek didn't burn, and they were the only eucalypts that didn't because everything else just went black. So, your fire resistant trees are generally thick bark trees, smooth bark trees, broad leaf trees, such as European deciduous trees, and of course, succulents, which are full of water. European deciduous trees can actually be grown quite near the house. 
if embers land on them, they usually just piss it out so they can protect roofs, they can cut down the wind coming. As in, we have very violent winds in, in fires often here. And in um, 1983, roofs were actually, actually torn off. So a, very, a large, broad-leafed, densely foliated European deciduous tree can actually slow down the wind and help protect the roof. There was another story of Marysville. Now, Marysville is a little tourist town. It's at its height in the 1920s and early, early 20th century. And it, it's in a, in, a, in a valley, but it's an valley that's like an inverted, inverted funnel. So embers are just drawn right into it. <laughs> so that when those devil fires were all burning all around it, all their embers came into on Marysville and it, it was <coughs> multiple fires everywhere. <coughs> but there was one man, he was the proprietor of the Crossroads Inn, Crossways Inn, and he, he stayed with his home. He didn't go down onto the football over a bit painted by embers and smoke like everybody else. He stayed with his place. He had a, a large guest house home and cabins. He had some, some knowledge of, of protecting his place for, not, for bushfire, but not, not detailed, but he certainly had enough and he certainly had de determination and he had European deciduous trees around his house. So bit by bit, with only a bucket of water and that little creek that was running by, he saved his house. The, the cabins were burnt, but he saved the, the big property and it was due to those European deciduous trees giving him the shelter and giving the house the shelter. They were mostly elder, oak, twisted willow, copper beech, all those, all those types of things. There, were, there was such a lot of them. It was a large property. But it was the European deciduous trees that played such a huge part, as David had mentioned in his story. The properties that make plants fire resistant are moisture in their leaves, such as, of course, the succulents, minerals in their leaves, ammonium phosphate and sodium chloride, which of course is salt, a low cellulose content, lack of waxes, oils and resins in their leaves, broad leaves and fat, sappy leaves and smooth, non-peeming bark. And the properties that make them hazardous are long, thin leaves, Thin twigs, brittle, lived, lived, brittle leaves, brittle leaves and twigs, bark that's stringy or hairy. This sort of stringy bark, which which we call um, I think what we call them now anyway, they're stringy bark. And once they're alight, they can fly up to forty kilometres, whereas normal leaves just you know, depending on the type of the, the um, the vegetation pines can fly for four kilometres and eucalypts for eight kilometres. But these stringy barks, and they catch in the, in the, in the you know, where, where branches meet, they can fly for 35 kilometres. So we've got a tree like that, you really need to pull the, all those bits out. Some trees have got a capacity to spit sparks. And of course, where the lowest part of the canopy grows close to the ground, such as in conifers, that creates a big hazard. Now you probably think, how on earth am I going to know whether my plants have got minerals in them and so forth? But there is a flammability test which I devised myself, and it's quite simple to do and it's very trustworthy. You have to be a bit careful. You just take a branch, not a branch, an amount of about that much of your plant. You put on some gloves that aren't going to ignite or else you, you hold it in tongs. If you've got a gas stove, then you write, you can probably use a cigarette lighter in the sink, but you just move it slowly, very slowly towards the flame. Now, if it just crinkles up like this, it's fire resistant. It's not going to spit flames. It's not going to hurt other plants. It's not going to light buildings. If it does spit, well, you really, perhaps you better put it far away from the house. If it flares up suddenly and 
then you'll have to drop it into your bucket of water you've prepared so you don't get burnt yourself. If it flares up suddenly, it's better to take it out of the garden. But that's an easy self-do flammability test. Four is cleaning of ground litter. A debris like this can be blown under the houses. It can then uh, ignite in, in the wall spaces. It can pile up against flammable walls. It needs to be removed for 20 metres around the house. And if you're on a slope, add half to a metre for every degree of slope. So that's half to a metre for every degree of slope that you need to clear away your debris. As I've just said, the dead matter removed from trees and shrubs. Tree trunk strips of those streamer-like barks. Under trees need to be cleared of debris and long grass. Now a tree can't burn unless there's something burning underneath it. You try to light a railway sleeper or a big log in your fire with a match. You can't, you've got to have your kindling. It's the same with trees. If there's nothing growing underneath it, the tree won't ignite. If it's in a forest and you come to this area where it's cleared underneath, a few might burn from the top, but you, they don't burn from the top down and very soon that fire will be slowed. So it's very important to clear away anything that's growing underneath your trees. The trees need to be pruned two metres from the ground, two metres from buildings, and two metres from walls and roofs. As the conifers need to be pruned from eight metres. They found that at Canberra in the 2003 fires, where there were quite a lot of conifers, and they had uh, pruned some of them to six feet, but they ignited. Those they pruned to eight feet from the ground didn't ignite. Mulch. Mulch is very, very important. Pine bark, of course, is a very popular mulch. It uses a lot, of, a lot of material that some industries don't need. But ignited bulk bark peat mulch pieces, they become like glowing embers and they fly for, for quite a long distance. They'll stay alight for 30 minutes. The finer mulches, chips, straw, bark, sawdust, and so on, they can stay alive for 15 minutes. Again in Canberra, a large proportion of houses were, were ignited when the, um, the glowing bark mulch landed on them and there was no one there to put it out. The only safe mulches are compost, pebbles, or granitic sand. I think you'll call it road mulch. Topography, you need to pay attention to your topography problems. If you're on a hill, you have got big problems. Such as places like in our, our um, Blue Mountains where they're on the edges of cliffs. Fire traveling uphill doubles its speed for every degree of slope. But terracing can help to cut the rush and the long sweep of those flames. You cut a wide area of flat ground alternating with a vertical area, and as the flame comes up, it will be hindered. Your flat area should be wider than the height of the house. It's the flat part wider than the height of the house. So that's the six, but we left out the township. Township hazard can be decreased by clearing the undergrowth and litter in nearby bushland. And it all depends on the density, the species, the distance from the houses. And this can vary from 30 to 300 kilometers. No, kilometers. So start that again, just wipe that a little bit. It can vary from 30 to 300 meters. So that if you're in um, a bushland area, like I have a, a little way away from me, this, the, the trees are fairly far apart. It's, it's, not, it's not as highly flammable as it is in, in the Dandenong Ranges. You, you know, your 30 metre clearing might be enough, but perhaps, you know, in um, 
in the Blue Mountains or in, in um, Kangaroo Ground or any of those really, really dense areas, you might need to go, especially in Mary's Wall, you might need to go for 300 metres. But so that it's not so much the burning as, as often gets done here out in the bush, right? We're do it, doing a big burn today and it's right out in the bush. That's not going to help anybody. It needs to be, it doesn't always have to be burned. It can be just cleared away by other methods. There are other methods, I'm sure David knows it plenty about that. Um, but to have them cleared their ground litter and all their rubbish for that distance can vastly protect a town because any fire in the bush piling up behind it will slow down and possibly extinguish by the time it reaches that area. Reduction of flammable vegetation in streetscapes and parks. Where I am, we have stringy bark and thick barked, loose barked trees in the streets, which is ridiculous. In the parts of Canberra, where they had the European deciduous trees that was in the more long established areas, hardly a house was touched, but where they'd got into their heads to have in the 1970s, it was very fashionable to have native trees in the street. That there was much more house losses there. So reduction of flammable vegetation, not just around your houses, but in your streetscapes and parks. In that respect, increase the amount of fire resistant planting in the streetscapes and, and parks, such as the European deciduous trees, which give more shade anyway. Sports grounds, parks, pools, even fire retardant crops sited on the town's firewood side can act as a buffer and building blocks large enough to allow your garden layout features. I could go on forever, but essential bushfire safety tips has all these full data details of all these aspects. And thank you, Joan. Joan, you are thorough. I, I love the, the elements and the details and really uh, keying on the idea of broadleaf deciduous. This is something that David talked about a little bit in Facing Fire about his cultivation of um, the riparian area behind him and something that we lack in British Columbia due to the, the forestry practices where we monocrop conifers and we in terms of our, our replanting there's very little in terms of deciduous replanting and those that are uh, planted or come up are, are treated with glyphosate because it reduces the total yield. So I think your topic again has such a, uh, you know, the details on the topic has such an ap application to what we're speaking about. And I so appreciate the level of detail you brought to it. And I think the other thing you brought in is terraces. And in researching the movie, I had a chance to speak with Sepp Holzer and Josef Holzer and the Kramaterhof, um, the original Sepp Holzer farm, in Austria at 1100 to 1500 meters above sea level. And one of the things that Yosef, his son who now manages the farm really wanted to get across is that it's not the fact that the terraces have 72 ponds that makes it fire resilient. It's the fact that it's that interconnected ecology and the spacing of the terraces that creates fire breaks. And I love that you brought that up because it again shows that these are principles that are not situated in countries or certain ecologies, but fire is fire is fire anywhere. And we can bring these concepts to any place on the planet and then moderate for the specific vegetation that we have. I think that brings us to a great question for you, David. Um, this is the great thing about principles is that we can, we can go to different places and have, have the same understanding or potentially come to the same conclusions. Being the co-originator co of permaculture, what, what and how do the permaculture principles and strategies apply to the subject of wildfire safety from your perspective? Yeah, well, I suppose, especially the early articulation of permaculture was often focusing on uh, a house or a homestead in a, a rural environment with uh, larger control of the landscape and also sometimes the opportunity to, okay, where, where are we going to site houses and site access roads and uh, dams, which are the main form of water supply in uh, rural Australia on uh, clay based soils where you're catching. Uh, winter water for later use to uh, irrigate gardens and how all these elements, uh, including things like stone retaining walls, different things can be organized in the landscape. And 
zooming back out and thinking, Albert, firstly at a bioregional scale of where are the prevailing worst bushfire sectors? Where are the, the powerful winds in drought conditions that tend to deliver fire? And then how is that modified by the local landscape and that critical factor that Joan mentioned of uh, slope uh, and aspect. So developing this concept of the fire sector, not that fire can't come from any direction, but to sort of have a sense of where the uh, most protective work needs to be done. And as Joan said about extending out the fuel reduction work, but whether you can actually design that landscape. So the zone and sector planning tools, which is you know, the sun sector, the wind, in some sites, the flood sector, of having that as sort of like a, a mandala or a mind map that help inform you of where you place things uh, in the landscape. And then to using these passive aspects of fire resistance and resilient design, rather than just, oh, when the fire comes, we're gonna have the big pump or the, the action to fight the fire that these passive elements like plants that are helping rather than hindering and all of these elements that then make the active elements of the active aware um, householder that much more effective. And that all those being, uh, that being active in preparing and defending against bushfire threat reflect the principle of observe and interact rather than just being dependent on centralized systems or or responding to something when you're told uh, to do so. Um, and I think that the diversity and integration of elements and behaviors that collectively contribute to wildfire resilient design and defense shows that there's no one big simple answer to the question, but that this um, reflects the principles of small and slow solutions, diversity, of solutions and the integration of those solutions. Whereas we have this, the modern mindset often thinks there's one big answer to any big problem. And certainly wildfire and defense illustrates that it's all of these things all collectively and how they mesh together and uh, help each other. So I think that's how Though, so many of those examples of what Joan was talking about, just in relation to vegetation, but obviously in relation to the other areas, reflect those more general principles that we can apply everywhere. Almost like it depends. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> For those are, that aren't familiar with permaculture, the middle name of permaculture is it depends and that these conversations are contextually based. It's always about being responsive. And I one of the reasons why I love permaculture so much is that it forces us back into a critical thinking role to be present to a landscape, to have long, thoughtful, protracted observations and to really be responsive. And Joan and David's answers, I think, combined really give us a sense that there may be a primary fire sector, but as you start to take a look at slope or type of vegetation, you can have hotter fire sectors, so to speak, and sort of less fire sectors, areas that your responses and the different types of strategies you use. Um, again, in Facing Fire, we had a, a permaculture designer, Daniel Halsley, um, who wrote Integrated Forest Gardening, which I noticed that you, you distribute as well, really speak about our flammable life. And so when we get into building design, being very conscientious about our flammable life. And Joan, I was, I was gobsmacked at the detail you went into in terms of what you build your homes out of and what you build your inner walls out of and what you build your, like everything was so well considered. And we do have a, a a question already that will drive to that. So I, I'm appreciative that everything's coming together. For folks that are interested or already have been sold on the book, I put a link in that before March 14th, 2022, you can get your own copy of Essential Bushfire Safety Tips for a discount of 15%. And there are two different um, URLs. One takes you to the Australian store, one takes you to the US, the North American store. So if this is of interest to you, you've, you think that this is a good value to you, I highly recommend picking up the book. Um, I've, I've been very, 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 very impressed by the distillation. You could call it a single malt of 
bushfire safety, which is goes down very smooth and very easy. Um, Joan, for a final question for you before we get to questions from the audience, and again, anybody who has any questions, please make sure to put them into the Q&A. And this is probably the most controversial conversation that you are quite an advocate of and something that when we talk about in British Columbia, it's almost, and, and in the Pacific Northwest and across America, it's almost exclusively leave. There's no question about it. You leave your home and that is all there is to it. And yet there's a number of case studies and stories about communities normally, but also individual homes that stay and defend that have prepared that have planned and have practiced these three Ps that you key on and have defended their home successfully because as that firestorm, which we call in North America comes in and the ember storm or the ember front that comes in, they're able to stop the fire before it starts because if you do have a well-established fire break around your home, then the crown fires, the fires that are within the, the forest because our, our forests are predominantly conifer can't get close enough because we have that break and ground fire has been addressed because of the breaks and a lot of that layer and that litter layer that can uh, bring fire into the canopy, the, the ladder fuels are removed. So this is something that's quite controversial, which is, you know, you have um, this conversation about staying and defend and bushfire authorities say that houses cannot be saved in a catastrophic fire. So why in your books do you say that they can? Because it's true. It's entirely possible for people who are thoroughly prepared physically, emotionally and knowledgeably to have reduced the flammable vegetation around their property, a property that they're protected from ember entry, to safely defend it, even to have it survive a wildfire, one of the most severe wildfires, even if they're not there. There's a young woman in Tasmania and she built her home on a site surrounded on three sides by dense state forest. She built it according to the information in essential bushfire safety tips. She had intended also to follow the advice there on how to protect it. But in the meantime, before the fire came, she had joined one of the emergency services. So when the fire did come, she wasn't home. But when she got home, there was her home just waiting for her. All the forest burnt like dead sticks and her home was intact because she had properly protected it. Mind you, our fire authorities are following your ways now. Everybody out. No wonder everybody's houses burned down because nobody's there. But it used to be like that here. They used to say firefighters fight the fire, people defend their homes. And don't expect somebody to knock on your door and tell you what to do. And that's what people used to do. More and more of them, I think, are deciding that it's not such a good idea. It's not all it's cracked up to be because you live for years sometimes in temporary accommodation. But all wildfire research shows that far more houses have been destroyed when towns have been evacuated and left to their fate. And in 1983, in what is still the biggest and most thorough wildfire investigation in the world, the investigators scrutinized every house in the fire zone, burnt, unburnt, and partially burnt. At that time, a big question asked was, why is it that one house can be destroyed and the one next door isn't? It wasn't known what was the cause of their vulnerability. Was it the color of their paint? Was white paint better than dark paint? Was it the slope of their roof? They didn't know. But they did after this huge investigation. The two major groundbreaking discoveries they made were that 90% of homes defended by one or more people over the age of 10, one or more people over the age of 10, safely to save their homes and that 100% of homes were saved where there were three or more knowledgeable people there. The other big aspect they discovered was that the vast majority of houses had been destroyed not by the outreach of flames, but by the entry of embers into the house, not by radiant heat or flames, but by embers. 
The reduction of houses to rubble during a wildfire is not caused by the intense flames or the intense heat of the wildfire. It's caused by the intense heat of the burning contents of the house itself. Broken windows let in the tiniest sparks. Crevices can let in embers. In violent winds, de hurtling debris can smash windows and masses of embers will come in through those windows. Gaps in roof capping, cracks in cladding, faulty eaves, they all let embers into rooms, ceilings, walls, subfloor places where they smolder and gradually take hold. What happens when a spark or ember from a wildfire is blown inside an unattended house? It lands on cushions or curtains, smolders and flares. It throws embers and flames until fire spreads through furniture and fittings, clothes and kitchen cupboards, papers and plastics and fly sprays and cleaning fluids. Some explode. If no one douses those first embers, the fire moves on through the house until all is left is a pile of ash and twisted metal. Look at the news pictures of houses destroyed by wildfire. Really look at them. So many that are reduced to pocket handkerchiefs of ash have their trees around them untouched. And encroaching flames have caused the houses to burn. How could the trees not have burnt? Now look at these pictures of your British Columbia fire in Lytton in 2020. Can you see that? Yes, we can. The house is fully engaged, but the trees beside it, that tall tree beside it, hasn't ignited. The fence hasn't been ignited. Here's another one. The house is just re reduced to rubble. Joan, it's upside down. Oh, well, that's not very helpful, is it? <laughs> the house is reduced to rubble, upside down or not. Right side up. It looks great. The fence hasn't been touched. The trees in the background aren't touched. It can only have been ember entry caused that. You look at aerial pictures um, in, a, in um, Colorado, in Par I think it was Colorado, Paradise, a few years back. And you see house after house, just pockets of ash, but the, M, the trees all around them untouched. Now, on the other hand, I'll tell you about Kangaroo Valley. Kangaroo Valley is a small heritage town in New South Wales. It's overlooked by mountains covered in dense, highly flammable eucalypt forest. And many outlying properties are built in that flammable forest. You'd think nothing could save them from a wildfire and that the only safe thing would be to evacuate. But it wasn't going to be safe to evacuate because to do so, they would have had to cross the Kangaroo River in a rickety old heritage bridge that couldn't be mended because it was heritage. So they decided that they would stay to protect their properties. They looked like helpless burnt offerings because even if they could have got over that bridge, they had to drive 200 kilometers through bush line tracks to get to another larger, safer town. Anyway, they were not helpless. They were ready. Months before summer, a group had formed a community wildfire planning committee. They had my books and after talks with me, they thoroughly informed themselves on all the effective ways in which they could prepare their properties to safely protect them and at the same time, protect themselves. On January the 4th, 2020, the same year as your Lytton fire, a massive fire swept down the hills, totally destroying the forest. Everyone who had stayed 
who prepared their home and acted according to their plan and defended them according to everything that had been practiced, saved their homes. No lives were lost. No one was even injured. No one required any sort of medical attention. It's, it is entirely possible for people who are thoroughly prepared and who have a well-informed, well-practiced plan to safely defend it. I'll just show you these screenshots that I took from an aerial video, video which is so moving that shows house after house standing in those blackened sticks of forest, but perfectly intact, but just two pictures. This one, you might have to look carefully, but you'll see in the clearing, the house and all around it, the burnt forest. I've been muted. Look down. Could you not hear any of my talk? No, we can hear it all. Oh, good, because I don't think I was muted. You see, you can see quite well if you look down at the, the bottom corner of that picture, quite a large property, quite safe amongst all the blackened trees. You need to have your plan and you need to practice it. And a well-informed wildfire safety plan recognises that every fire is different. Forest or grass, mild or intense, sudden or forecast, long-term or short. It needs to be based on the most comprehensive, authentic information available. It needs to be written down. It needs for every member of the family to have their appointed tasks and to know what to do. And it needs, as I stress again, to be practiced frequently. The more you prepare, the less there is to do on the day, the less stress on the day. The essential bushfire safety tips sets out all the aspects of property preparation that's needed for them. Every aspect you need to think about in planning for the safety of your family and your animals. We mustn't forget the animals because there is a big section in the book on preparing for safety of stock. And all the, and it has all the alternative actions. This is the safe thing to do. This is the dangerous thing to do. All the safe and hazardous actions and reactions on the day. Every word, as I said, has been verified by Australia's most eminent bushfire, safety, bushfire scientists. The aim of essential bushfire safety tips is to enable you to create a safety plan to suit your own circumstances. Everybody's is different. It's not a one size fits all, as we're told by the authorities. And after the fire has passed, you too, like so many of our readers, and feel empowered to save your home with its all precious contents and yourselves. Thank you, Gavin. Thank you, Joan. It, uh, it's a message that obviously has resonated across Australia, and I hope that it resonates to folks who are elsewhere because it's one that we need to hear. And when we take a look at the world, we're, we're more and more aware that we live in a very fragile world with fragile systems. And I think what essential bushfire safety tips in your work really establishes is that we can have, be in an anti-fragile state. We can not only plan and practice and also prevent what we're defending against, but at the same time, the act of doing so puts us from a place of a consumer of fire uh, prevention and into a producer. Um, Bill Mollison, the co-originator of permaculture had that as one of his uh, major quotes that has outlived him. The greatest change we need to make is from consumption to production, even if only on the small scale and in our gardens. And that last bit, you know, if 10% do, it, do this, there's enough for everyone. And that concept I think moves outside of the garden. It comes into us becoming 
the heroes we're waiting for, so to speak, or we're the help that we're looking for. And I can't help but think about a taxonomist I know who continually says that due to our bone structure and the change of who we are, we need to reclassify humans as homo sapien fragilis domesticus because we cannot live without all of the systems around us to keep us alive. And here we have you and David advocating strongly that it is our ability to defend our homes, to prepare. If we decide to live in a fire ecology, it, it, it need not end in tragedy, I think is, is what I take away from so much of what you're saying. And your examples are phenomenal to have a group of individuals who saw that, that information, took that upon themselves and put it into practice is all the proof in the pudding you need. Uh, which leads us to our last question for David. David, how have you applied uh, Joan's work in the field for yourself or for clients? How does it look for you? Uh, yes, well, I suppose the, the strongest way in which uh, we've applied so many of the things Joan's talking about and, and actually using her books ourselves has been in the design and maintenance of our property in Meliodora, which is two and a quarter hectares, uh, two and a quarter acres uh, on the edge of perhaps one of the most fire vulnerable small towns in, in central Victoria. Uh, and maintaining that as a fire safe property uh, with a maintained and updated uh, fire season plan to stay and defend uh, the property in all circumstances. So we've made that clear articulation uh, always. Our town has uh, limited um, uh, evacuation places anyway, and uh, you know we see the very positive uh, potential to uh, protect uh, the place. And that's been over the last three decades. And that plan was activated in 2019 when the fire was threatened by fire despite the authorities evacuating all the similarly threatened uh, properties. Now, I wouldn't in any way claim that story, and I have written that up on our website, that that, that threat was in any way like the scale of the catastrophic fires that so many people have, have, have faced. But it was the first time in all those years that uh, we got to enact the plan beyond uh, the preparation stages. But in that, I would say the earlier experience um, in Black Saturday in 2009, there were no fires in our immediate region. But I was in a state of alertness, recognising that the weather was so extreme that I needed to start enacting our fire plan as though there might be be fires in our region. And as a result of that experience of being outside in 42 degree heat with strong winds, with eight degrees um, humidity showing on our weather station and starting to uh, block the gutters on our uh, house and other buildings, I thought, mm, this all takes a little bit longer than I thought. And through that process, we tweaked our fire plan to to say, okay, when the, the fire weather conditions reach this threshold, even if there are no fires in the region, we implement one aspect of our plan, which we haven't done before or haven't got to, to see practice that right through. Because previously our fire plan, we practiced all the bits, but until you get to the next threshold, We'd never practiced those huge run of things that would happen in the, the lead up to fire. So that lived experience and tweaking and refining that, uh, because we do take that um, uh, very, very seriously. And of course, we've also worked in the wider landscape around us on the, on the public land and a lot in trying to uh, build community awareness and all of these other things. But the direct application has been on that immediate, uh, the design of the house, the design and management of the property and our own seasonal fire uh, behaviour 
and um, same. It sounds like when you, you put it into practice, there is a, an adaptation period where you, you take the concepts, the concepts are good in principle, like all principles are, but then you have to uniquely tune it to not only the landscape, but also the people. I think that was something I took away from the interview that we did for Facing Fire is that it was really about the people that made the difference and uh, ensuring that the different individuals had different responsibilities, because if they all had the same responsibilities, chances are that they couldn't fulfill those responsibilities. So having a, a, an honest and a frank discussion about who did what within mm. your situation. Yes, and you know we're now in a situation where we're of course decades older than we were when we came and we now have three semi-autonomous households on this property. We have a lot more assets to protect than what we did when we first came. And our place, we believe, with those three semi-autonomous households needs more than two people to actively defend it in the worst, the most catastrophic of fire situations. But we have that capacity here uh, as well to, uh, to do that. Yeah, and I think that speaks to the, the need for folks that live remotely or rurally and have gone there because they don't want to be around anybody else that in these situations, it's there's value in having connectivity with community members, building fire plans, building resiliency plans, connecting with government funds for um, load reduction or for grazing management. I have a colleague who works in goat grazing management and vegetation removal in Alberta. You know, the, the there's so many strategies to do it, but I think Joan's initial conversation of you have to have a plan and you have to be practiced to be prepared. If you don't have those two things, you are joking thinking that you're prepared because you have a sense of, I've got my bug out bag and my vehicle. And if you haven't thought about where you're going or what you're going to do with that or where you're going to land or what that looks like, then you're really just playing with fanciful castles in the sky. You're not really putting into practice. Yeah, the other thing I would mention is that in a lot of working with people on these subjects as a consultant and uh, as a as a teacher in permaculture design courses, found that a lot of people say, well, my plan is to leave. And then beyond that, that has sort of mentally absolved them of actually planning. Well, where are you going to go to? And the, what, what is your trigger for when will you leave? And what if is your backup plan if you can't leave? And so I sort of tried to turn that around that if you have plans to leave, and of course those are completely valid, everyone's situation is different, that doesn't actually absolve you of making a plan. It's actually a more complex plan. Whereas the stay and defend plan is a sort of a fallback. If that, you know, we don't manage to save the fences out there, you know, um, you know, there's this fallback and there's this fallback. And as Joan has explained so often through her work, that even in that last extreme sense, that you, the house is a shelter, a survival place, even in the worst of circumstances where you don't manage to save the house, almost certainly the house can save you. So that there's this, you know, that, that with that type of stay and defend plan, there's a fallback, a fallback, a fallback, whereas with the leave, stay, there's always a bifurcation. There's always, there has to be two plans and you have to, at some point, you know, be aware of that, of having to jump to another, which is quite difficult psychologically for a lot of people. And so getting people to understand that, that the leave plan is actually a more complex one in some ways even though it feels like it's simple. It's such a good point. It's such a good point that so few people recognize that the calories it takes to get to the point or the trigger point that goes, okay, now we're leaving as opposed to, no, we've designed this place to stay. We've designed a plan to stay and we're going to defend in a way that makes sense and it's practice and we know what we're doing. And then there's a right action or a right livelihood to it. You're actually in action working towards it. And I think this is the biggest part that I think Joan has talked about in development is that after that fact, after that defense, there's a sense of resiliency of 
of self-determination that's hard to get in any other way, which again, the, the two of you may be battling for the patron saint of self-determination, but I'm, I'm sure Joan will win the arm wrestle. Um, thank you so much to you both. Uh, we've got a few questions and I know we're very close, if not over our time, at least due to when we were supposed to start, but we did start a little bit late. So if you're, you're both comfortable, I would like to go through the questions if that's all right. And Joan, if, if you do need to leave, I totally understand. And um, we, can, we can say our farewells, but uh, for everybody else, thank you so much for joining us. If you have to leave before we get to questions again, we do have the opportunity to pick up um, essential bushfire safety tips for a 50% discount before Monday. The two links are there. And for anybody else who's watching the replay, it is in the email. And just a few comments here. One was a uh, brilliant book. So excited to pick it up. Thank you so much, Joan. Uh, such an informative webinar. Uh, I've already purchased the book. Thank you, Jab and Joan and David for the incredible work that you do. And uh, Kathy just commented to David's comments. Exactly. We're totally caught off, caught off guard last summer. We normally don't deal with drought and wildfires in our region of Northwest Ontario, but a huge wake up call. Kathy just bought the book as well. So uh, lovely to hear. All right. So our first question is, I have Joan's fabulous book by uh, Janine and plan to stay and defend my property on Kangaroo Island. I think this is for Joan. Can embers enter the ceiling space via the Whirly gig? Joan, any thoughts on that? Ah, yes, yes, they can. Um, I have, I've been told about that happening. Uh, the way to protect a Whirly gig is to put some metal flywire over the top of it. Okay. It's the same with air conditioners. They can come in air conditioners, even if you have them turned off. But a metal, metal plywire, 1.1 um, millimetres will um, reflect radiant heat. 3.3 uh, um, millimetres will reflect radiant heat and 1.1 millimetre will stop the end of sparks. Incredible. Uh, Javan, of course, that's why we called our <laughs> book The Flywire House, because it was just emphasising this, this building material, which people don't think of as a very significant building material is a great way, certainly not just in new construction, but also to retrofit all sorts of tricky situations in, in, in buildings that uh, you know, fly away, especially the stronger, uh, tougher uh, materials. Um, so it's, uh, yes, can be used in many situations. Over, over windows, the outside of windows, and subfloor gaps as well. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And uh, I love how that information is, is coming out of you on demand. That's, uh, that's impressive. Um, uh, Kathy McGowan, uh, does Jones book show how to integrate an off-grid suppression system integrated with rainwater catchment? I live in a rural era, area with a volunteer fire department. We're on our own. And this has been a plus one. So at least two people had this question. Joe? Um, I don't exactly know what you mean by integrating a suppression. Could you put it perhaps a different way? Yeah, Kathy, if, if you wouldn't mind just making a comment there and letting us know if you're thinking, is this a, a rainwater catchment system that then has an integrated pump or something like it that then goes into either a pump system or a, a, a roof system? If you could give us a bit more context, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, as she's doing that, we're going to move on to Jackie's question. What sort of compost is effective as a safe mulch to reduce fire risk? My compost has leaves, branches, twigs. Are these okay if decomposed? Well, they're not really compost if they're still leaves, branches, and twigs. <laughs> it needs to be down to very, very you know, fine, soil-like looking material. That's, that's real compost. Gotcha. And that is safe as if pebble, pebbles are good, but of course you can't uh, break your pebbles in and help your soil structure by that. Wonderful. Thank you, Joan. Yeah, I, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great moment. <laughs> um, Aaron Axelrod, David, could you speak more to the stay and defend and how much education do you have, have to have, i.e. if you are part of a 200 person strong community, how much commitment do you have to have to safely leverage the stay and defend as a strategy for bushfire safety to save human lives? And this was also commented by somebody else. Um, oh. Was that to Joan or? or it was directed to you, David, but I'm, I'm sure Aaron would appreciate yeah. answers from both. Yeah. Well. Do you want to um, uh, respond to that, 
Joan? Well, I have to say, if you read through the book thoroughly, um, you will be able to do that. Because it does list out everything to do, um, the fors and against, the dangers and the, and the safety factors of each aspect. You know, whether you, you must have your protective clothing to defend. Um, yes, I'd have to read out the whole book now to tell you it all, but it is, it is all there in the book and it can be done as, you, as I've just you know, shown really in a few, very few of the instances, I've got a, a, a pile that high of people who've written and said that they'd saved their homes and saved their lives by um, the use of the, of the book. Um, so, yes, I really think that's probably the best answer. I suppose I would um, add to that the, the people being realistic about their own internal psychological resilience. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Because some people are, um, are habitually paralysed by uh, crisis. Um, obviously, preparation can can allow people of that disposition to overcome that. And, and so that's why you know, planning is really important. Whereas other people are actually empowered by this. And we see this um, work of colleague um, uh, Daryl Taylor, who was a survivor at King Lake in following that experience. He did a lot of research and found that in disasters, um, up to a quarter of people going through a disaster can virtually be uh, catatonic, dis psychologically disabled by the experience. That maybe 50% are sort of in a bit of a state of shock, but um, uh, sort of on the edge, and a quarter become super empowered by the experience. And that actually in the self-organization of communities going through disasters, the 25% can muster together 50% and collectively they can look after the 25% the who have been sort of shattered by the experience. So, I mean, that's of course like after something. And so I think there is a, a, a big range that only people can sort of deal with their own um, preparedness and then of course there's levels of commitment what is one's commitment to place varies enormously from people who've you know uh, been owner builders you know people who had experience of their children being born at home in their house to someone in a temporary rental somewhere moving through something <laughs> with very little attachment uh, you know, so these things are important. And the last thing I would say is people need to think where they will go and how they will sit out the disaster when the authorities don't allow them back and they don't know what's happened to their place, maybe for many days and even longer. And part of my answer to that is I know I have to stay and defend and be here because I would be a danger if I was in one of those um, recovery centres watching the, the TV screens, putting out the same information, holding my little pack of recovery uh, plastic food and stuff given to me. I'd be a danger to the people around me. <laughs> you know? So you don't want people like, like me sitting in those sort of places. <laughs> So, you know, realistically dealing with thinking through those, all those issues. There's a couple of things I could add to that too, is that to have uh, street committees or town committees, such as Ken Grove Valley did, street committees, our fire authorities used to help to um, organise those, where people gather together and pool their information and have phone trees to let each other know things and so forth. That's, that's, that's a great empowerment so that you're not just on your own in your knowledge and in your trials. The other thing is that if, you're, if you feel too afraid to um, decrepit like me, to 
actually defend your home these days or for any other reason, or you know, even if it's a, if it's a rental, um, you need to think whether you really, it's safe for you to leave, to keep on living in that dangerous area. Some of the places uh, around Melbourne in the Dandenongs, I wouldn't be there in the summer for quids. Um, but you also need to realise that if you are going to evacuate, you often don't get much time more in, in warning. And to do it late is the most dangerous thing you can possibly do. Really, to all boil it down, the only safe way not to be there, if that's what you want to do, is to go away somewhere else for the whole summer. Or not to live there. So that, that is the reality of it, that you're not always going to get the warning. Because all bushfires aren't the same. Something could start in the paddock next door to you. Or it could be coming over the next hill and you could get a, a day or half a day's warning. You just don't know. So if you really feel you couldn't possibly face it, um, to do that. And another aspect is that when a house burns down, it's not just the house. Oh, it doesn't matter about the house. You can always rebuild. Well, you can't always. But it's the precious contents. It's what's in it. It's all your lifetime and often things that have been handed down generations. They're all lost, but they don't have to be because as I've explained in my book, and this is what my daughters and I used to, used to do when I lived in the suburb and they lived out in the bushfire areas. At the beginning of summer or late spring, they used to bring their most precious things. My daughter was, one daughter was an artist. She'd bring all her paintings to me and I would mine them for the summer. If you haven't got a handy mother who can do that, you can even put them in a railway locker. You can find somewhere. You can bury the crystal in the garden. Uh, there's lots that you can do to protect your possessions if you're not going to be there. Thank you, Joan, and, and thank you, David. Um, and thank you for bringing in the psychology. I think that's something that a few people think about. And I know individuals like Rosemary Morrow, who's worked in, um, in displaced individuals, uh, situations speaks about that psychology and there's there's quite a bit about that in the ecosystem restoration camp with uh, John D. Lau as well. Aaron would like to say thank you for the response. It was incredibly helpful. Uh, we've got a few folks that had said just purchase the book. Thank you so much. Bravo and thank you for this. Someone else who just had to leave and incredible. Thank you so much for the fantastic work. Javin, Joan and David. Great seminar. Just bought the book from Pete. Can't wait to read it. Thank you all from Allison. Lowell, thank you both for sharing your years of in-depth knowledge in this important life or death topic. Kathy, that was great. We need to do another one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know about the two of you, but we've got a lot more questions. And I know we said this was going to be an hour and a half. So uh, it seems to me, unless you're, um, you're itching to answer the rest of the questions, we may close it down. What, what are the two of you feeling? Time to close it down. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you for your uh, questions and your comments. My apologies if we didn't get to them all. There's always more interest than there is time. Uh, Joan and David, final words from both of you before we uh, say farewell to everyone. Well, yes, thank you, Javin, for giving me the opportunity to say these things to such a wide audience. And thank you, people, for being so interested and responsive. And thanks, David, for all you've done for me, for everybody, and for my book. Yeah, thanks, Jarvan, for uh, organising this. And uh, it, it takes me back to uh, when I was uh, sharing a, a public uh, platform in the, in the bushfire areas with Joan um, uh, more than a decade uh, ago. And uh, yeah, we really hope that uh, with uh, Meliodora Publishing's um, uh, partnership with uh, permaculture principals, our distributors, uh, getting books out, um, bypassing the big um, uh, corporate uh, monopolies uh, to get a, a greater presence in North America uh, for Joan's book and our other books that all encourage people to, to take more responsibility and empower them to live a better life now so we're hoping we can uh, 
do that and, and make that stronger connection between uh, us down here and you guys up there. <laughs> Thank you, David. Um, bring it back to the prime directive and take your responsibility for yourself and for that of your children. Love the circularness of it all. Um, so many great appreciations coming in here. Cheers and thanks for your time. I look forward to getting the book. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of folks that are saying, um, uh, could we do another one? Can we do a how-to? Um, I will definitely be open to that and reach out to Joan and David. Uh, time being what it is, we'll see where we go. And I just want to end with this, this last conversation. This, this feels like a really important one to end on. Um, I've been dreading spring the past few years, and now with this knowledge, I'm eager to get to work. And I think that's one of the most important things we can leave folks with is that with the right knowledge and the right attitude and with a sense of an open mindset versus a closed mindset, which we talk about in FIRE training quite a bit, and adding to that a growth mindset, the idea that there will be failures, we will read the landscape wrong. And as Sepp Holzer, one of my mentors, likes to say, the book of nature is always open. You can always go read it again when, not if you read it wrong. And I just want to thank everyone for participating today. We need all of us to be seeds that go out into our communities to share this knowledge, to share the wisdom and the knowledge that comes from Joan's book, and to also become practitioners, individuals that live this type of conversation and bring this conversation to our communities. And hopefully, as, as Joan has done, uh, in, impact regulation and government at the level that uh, she has. So thank you very much, everyone, for watching. It was such a pleasure. This was hosted by regenerativeliving.online. Uh, online educational platform that aims to teach practical skills to live on the planet as if we intend to stay. We do much more workshops like this, lots of great workshops coming up, all about decision making and water harvesting and uh, a couple of design processes that I think this would well connect to. Thank you, David, so much for your life's work and for participating today. Joan, thank you so much for your life's work and participating today. I'm overjoyed that the two of you could join me. And thank you everyone for coming together. Be well, and hopefully we'll see you in the next one. Take care.